Well, hello everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. And thank you so much for being with us and also doing what you need to do in terms of being uh, making a difference in this freedom movement in this current times. And uh, Roy Colan, Jane Marquis, Dr. Jane Marquis, and Hartmut uh, Schumacher, and yours truly, Grace Asagra, we'd like to welcome uh, for the first time in our platform, Alex Craner, and we're truly honored to have you, Alex. So thank you. It's my pleasure, and thank you for having me. And when I was trying, and to our audience, you this is this topic is so important. In our guests, will have because he has a lot of uh, expanded local and global. Um, perspective that's really important and crucial and he's not just talking about it theoretically but he has so much experience on what he's about to share and while I was uh, highlighting <laughs> some of the things that um, in in his bio I thought I'll just highlight this highlight that but then almost every statement is so important so I'll just mention a little bit about him and I'll let Alex lead us to this conversation. So Alex Craner is a market analyst, researcher, futures trader, investor, author, two times banned in Amazon, and former hedge fund manager based in the Principality of Monaco. He was born and raised in the socialist regime of former Yugoslavia under one party communist rule. And at 17, he joined a student exchange program in the United States and where he also took a lot of university studies. And from there, he went to Switzerland and continued his furthering his education in business and economics. And at one point, he also who uh, went to Venezuela and um, really did some work in Venezuela and at and his first, let's say, his first economic crisis experience as a young man was in 1994 and that brought him back to his native Croatia. And so he, he, he also is the type of person who he can just settle down for himself, meaning not contented for himself to do, but he joined the army so he could help his country. And now I also wanted to ask him what other things that really shape his world, because he just didn't focus on his financial prosperity on his own. And he he already has a five, uh, you know, uh, hedge fund manager, he has all connections with very wealthy people. But then he really wanted to help little people like us. Okay, so <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, you remind me so much also of there's I know there's people there who are as truthful and honest in their help in managing um, people's assets. So Alex, if, if there's anything more that you want to start with our conversation, we know that we are so concerned about our health. And I think every one of our viewers is starting to take care of ourselves. But then we're also concerned about what's going on with the economy, what's going on with with the monetary system and, you know, with, with Ukraine and Russia. So your thoughts on all of this. Well, uh, Grace, first of all, thank you very much for that uh, very flattering introduction. Um, you know, I'm, um, how do you call it? To, to, answer, to answer the question that you posed during, the, during this introduction, I, I, I think there are several moments that maybe determine the co course of my life most significantly. First, obviously, was that I grew up in the, in the socialist regime, you know, under one party system with being the communist party. So I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with how that works. Um, then it was my, um, my transfer over to the United States, where uh, as a very young man, you know, I was obviously very impressed by everything I encountered there. And it was only much later that it started dawning on me that not everything that's on the facade corresponds with the what's under the hood. Um, an important moment was the war in the Balkans, war in Croatia, uh, where I, I think
think I pretty much understood that you cannot trust what you read in the media or uh, and what you what you encounter in reality are are almost two different worlds there's the lies come very thick as a hedge fund manager uh, that job actually entails a lot of research and it's the kind of research that's not academic it's very practical because um, you need to you need to understand how the world really works as opposed to how they tell you that it does and so I, as a, as a, as a typical professional in that industry, you know, you would spend five, four, five, six hours a day reading and analyzing things. And, uh, you know, over, over time you start to develop a, a relatively a high resolution mental map of the world, what it is, how it works and how we're being lied to. And so, uh, part of, Part of that path has also led me to encounter certain people who are, we could say, on the other side. On the, you know, uh, you could you could you could put them in the warmongers basket. And uh, that led me to write my second book called "The uh, Grand Deception." My my, I, I've, I've I've published three books, and all three have been cancelled, by the way, not just one. Um, but Two of them are just basically on the problems of, uh, of investment management and trading. Uh, the one I published in 2017 was about uh, geopolitics, basically about the current relations between Russia and the West, but in the context of the 200 year history of this, of this relationship. Um, I published that book because even though it's not my, you know, I'm not a historian, I'm not a journalist. I published it because I was privy to certain, uh, certain events, or certain developments that made me realize that people who are in charge, you know, the, the high level establishment in the Western world is actually dragging us into a World War III and that somebody needs to unmask them and their agenda. And then I thought like, well, I may as well, since I know a little bit about this by now. And then as I started that project, you know, as I started writing the book that obviously needed further research. And then the more, the more research I did, the more important I realized that the story was. And then of course, uh, six weeks, five weeks after the book was published, it was, it was banned straight off. What happened was that, you know, I, I self published it. I put it up on Amazon. Um, basically, you know, if you do that, essentially nothing happens. The world doesn't know that you exist, uh, that you published a book. And so, uh, you know, maybe, maybe one, two, three copies per month were selling. But what happened is that some his a historian uh, in the United States picked up the book and read it. And then they published a review on Huffington Post. And uh, I was I was very pleased, obviously. And then I wanted to share it with somebody. You know, I wanted to send somebody, hey, check it out. My book uh, got a review on Huffington Post. But literally within about three hours, that review was taken down. It just vanished. And then within the week, the the book was banned. It was gone. And it was republished about nine months later by Red Pill Press, who were the only publisher who, who dared to republish the book. But also six weeks from that, it got banned again. The book is now available, but only from the website of uh, Red Pill Press. And, you know, that's their, uh, they sell it in Europe and in the States, but the world it's actually uh, I, I said to people that if they um, if they like I'm very happy always to send a PDF copy of the book free of charge I think it's a lot more important that people understand um, 
what is going on than my my my, my royalties and and little fees yeah so that's uh, that's how all that happened and unfortunately i have to say part of the 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 prediction in that book has uh, has come true and we see it in the war uh in ukraine between russia and U ukraine which which basically is, is waging war as a proxy for for nato and the united states alex um, I think you have really, for me, you have a very good handle on the whole history of America's related also to the world history. And that's what's in, so interesting about how, you know, your, your, your mind. And, and even when I was reading a little bit of your book, thank you for sending that to me. I'll be sharing that to others as well. Um, can you right now from writing that, can you also talk about the enterprise that you titled? And I believe that led me to watch Bill Moyer's documentary film and um, just connecting to what the, us, the group, you know, that we've been podcasting together, we know all along, but then we wanted our, our, our uh, viewers and our listeners to really keep remembering that there is that enterprise so we may be talking about um china in general russia in general or you american general but there is that enterprise do tell us yeah so the the enterprise is is, is let's say one of the colloquial names for what we also call uh, the swamp or the deep state and uh, even though our mainstream media would like us to believe that this is a, you know, some kind of a conspiracy, it is not a conspiracy. And it's actually on record basically since the 1980s. What happened then is that through the Iran Contras hearings, which were, I think, in 1986 or 1987, uh, all of this information came out. On congressional record and we have a, a number of american officials saying that yes this deep state organization exists they have their own air force they have their own army they have they have their own navy um, they have their own intelligence service and they do operate without any accountability to the american people or any other democratic institution you know nationally or globally and they have their own agenda uh, I think that it is important to understand this and, and appreciate that it's not a conspiracy theory because part of their power rests on being able to operate in the shadows and, be, and being able to always deny their very existence. But they do exist and they do operate and they do shape uh, the course of history. And I think that, you know, we can see that today it's it's not just it's not just an american organization i think that it's basically an organization of the western empire you know and the united states is only a part of that empire but you know it's it's connected with uh, with the structures in nato with the intelligence agencies of probably every western nation germany uh, britain italy sweden um spain israel and they coordinate uh policies whose agenda is basically to to preserve and to expand the western empire and i think that in the recent months we've seen that somehow somebody blew up the the north stream pipelines between russia and germany uh, somebody blew up the kirk bridge um in in crimea <laughs> Uh, somebody apparently tried to put together a dirty bomb provocation. And now we see that somebody even launched a, a missile attack from Ukraine on Poland. And they, they tried to, they tried to uh, frame Russia for this, to try to orchestrate a, a, a large escalation of war, world war uh, between NATO and Russia. Uh, thankfully, they failed. But... You know, it is important to know that these people exist because probably the the regular 
command and control hierarchies wouldn't stand for this, you know, because it's it's, you know, the ordinary soldiers of of in, of, of any of these nations doesn't want uh, to go to war over over false on false premises. It's the deep state that is always behind the lies that end up causing these big wars and the false flag provocations. You know, this happens all the time. We've had it, uh, you know, the Lusitan the sinking of the Lusitania passenger ship, which triggered World War I. Uh, we, had, uh, we had the Gulf of Tonkin, which triggered the, the Vietnam War. Um, it's, always, it's always something that, like some event that has strong emotional impact that galvanizes if not consent for war then at least at least a passive acquiescence and then you know if if nato now decided to go to war against russia and people were sufficiently convinced that maybe this is a necessary step then people say like well okay that's a bad thing but maybe it's uh, maybe it's for the best long term so let's go and let's get it done uh if we understand that these are false uh, uh, that these are false flag operations conducted by this deep state structure, uh, then we know not to believe their uh, their agenda and and not to support it. Thank you for your sharing. Now, before I pass it on to Roy, um, I wanted to see how helpful. Uh, what hopes? What positive um, solutions? Or what might be coming in the near future so that these things you know the deep state will not be in control they seem to be in control but i don't really want to fully embrace that and i've always heard people talk about the multipolar uh trading system or the, what the BRICS are doing so if you can just kind of share what you know about the you know that trading system and the economic system and please share well, okay. Two, two two things. The 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 new the new uh, trading system emerging uh, and and the 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 disabling of the deep state. I'm actually very optimistic about the the way things have been evolving in the world. We have to we have to keep in mind that we have something at this point in history that has never existed before, and that is the internet and the social media. And you know, as much as as much as the ruling establishment in in this world is trying to censor uh the you know censorship the idea of censorship may be effective where you have maybe a, a handful of very influential voices and then you can identify them and remove them from the, the discourse but today we have literally tens maybe hundreds of thousands of important influencers on all kinds of social media and you know maybe some people reach a, a few dozen or a few hundred of their of their audience some people reach millions but the problem is that you can't eliminate them all without plugging plugging out the internet altogether and so i think that the information is flowing in a much greater volumes this time around um in in history you know we've been lied into war because we depended we depended on radio, uh, on printed, on printed word, radio or television, and those were easily controlled by a small, uh, by a small handful of people who could be, in 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 turn controlled by these centers of power. Today, this is no longer possible. You know, you have, you have genuinely independent voices bringing information from all parts of the world, and then, you know, we've also seen that people have a sense, uh, to to turn away from the sources that they sense are deceiving them and that they are converging towards sources where they sense that they're getting important and meaningful information. And my favorite example of this is uh, CNN versus, versus uh, Joe Rogan, for example. So Joe Rogan, uh, you know, a completely uh, almost anonymous person only a few years ago became one of the most important voices he his average podcast gets 11 million views and some of them go to 50 or 60 million 
whereas the most trusted name in news, uh, CNN, cannot crack even a million viewers on their most popular shows. And, you know, I think it's important to keep this in mind because many of us get frustrated with people around us because maybe, you know, you realize something important about the events today and then you realize that most people don't understand this and they even, you know, they're even inclined to call you a loopy conspiracy theorist if you bring it up. But we have to look at the aggregate, you know, at the large numbers. And, and there we see the real picture. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens in trends that probably evolve slowly over, over, you know, months and years. But nevertheless, you have now this inversion where the most trusted name in news only a few years ago is being virtually ignored by the public, whereas uh, people like Joe Rogan, and I single him out only because, you know, I know, I know the number of his viewers, but there are literally thousands of voices today bringing us very important, very relevant information. And then I think that people, ordinary people, you know, uh, like, I'm not talking about experts. People are actually very, very good about sniffing what makes sense and what doesn't. And if you give them the right information, they will uh, get a good sense about what is really going on. And this is also the answer to the question of why are the people in charge so keen on deceiving us? Why is it so important to, for them uh, to keep uh, promoting these false narratives and to keep trying to silence uh, the, the voices that bring us the truth? Because what we think actually matters a great deal. And every single one of us uh, has an important role to play. And now, okay, to wrap this up, I just wanted to briefly address the, the you know, what you, what you call the new trading systems. Well, basically what we have is that, you know, for, for many decades now, uh, Western centers of power have, power have had a, a monopoly on global trade. You know, they control the, the, the trade flows, they trade, uh, they control the, 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 the naval sea routes, and they control the payment system. You know, so if you wanted to chart your own independent course, they could easily, they could easily sanction you. They could easily deprive you of, uh, of, 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 of exchange opportunities with the rest of the world. And uh, in that way, they were able to bludgeon many, many nations into submission to their system. Uh, failing that, they were happy to uh, conduct uh, assassinations of political leaders, um, color revolutions, coups, and uh, if all else failed, uh, a military invasion. But now the, the, um, the equation has changed dramatically. And I think that the watershed moment was uh, August of 2021 when the United States withdrew from Afghanistan. Because what you had at that moment is you had the spectacle of the president of Afghanistan escaping the country with, with, uh, with pallets of cash. And you had the president of the central bank, the governor of the central bank of Afghanistan doing the same thing. And the the really loud and clear message uh, from this to the empire's vassals is that the empire is no longer capable of controlling them. So now they had to think about making nice with their own populations and maybe thinking about um, developing their relationship with the emerging powers like Russia, like China, like Iran and, and so forth. And so I think that this change has been real. Uh, now, uh, starting in I think pretty much June of this year, um, Russia and China have been uh, announcing that they are preparing a new global uh, current reserve currency or a currency of exchange uh, that would be probably backed by uh, commodities like energy, gold, uh, metals, whatever, you know, and every country could participate. And now the thing that's really important here is that they have also signaled and I have to say, apparently, because this is this is not something that uh, I have found in any any reputable source article, you know. But there's been there's you know information emerged that they have signaled the potential partners around the world that if they decide to 
um, renege to default on their obligations to the Western financial institutions, that they wouldn't be penalized in this new system. And they also were made to understand that if they nationalize their uh, domestic resources and their industries, that the new system wouldn't penalize them for that. And so just this week, we've seen evidence of this actually happening because Burkina Faso, uh, the uh, Western African nation, has apparently begun the process of nationalizing their resources and they're kicking out the Western um, the Western uh, mining corporations out. And this is, again, you know, I, I have to say this is the news I got from Twitter, but these things will not be advertised in the mainstream media. There, there won't be very elaborate discussions about this because this threatens their whole system, namely uh, because you have Western corporations in control of these nations' resources, these resources represent money good collateral for the Western financial system. And if they start losing control of this collateral, then the Western financial system, which is already reeling from multiple crises, it's, it's, it's only accelerating towards a final collapse. Well, for the most of us, this is not good news for West, certain Western corporations, and it's not good news for the Western banking cartel, but it is, good, it is good news for most of the rest of us. And anyway, I'd, I'd, I'd leave it at this and then maybe, you know, we can go further by, by with your questions. Yeah. Roy? Yeah, no, thanks, Chris. Um, so, yeah, you mentioned about uh, Poland and basically as soon as that happened, I had everybody kind of telling me, oh, look, uh, Russia's... And I said, before I knew anything, I said, no, there's no way. That was done by Ukraine or whoever are the Americans. And the, the funny thing is, and I think it's, you know, because there's like two sides, is that as soon as the information came out that it was a, a so-called error that when you tell people, there's silence. And it's probably the same with the information that you're showing. You know, you give them the information that it's irrefutable and they don't even, they can't even comment, but yet they'll still attack you for the next thing, which, you know, and like I actually tried to get your book. I was checking on different things because not only Amazon, I couldn't get it. So I will check the the, the link that you mentioned there. Um, one thing that I, I saw that you were talking about, which I wasn't aware of about, was the, the fall of the Soviet Union and you know what what went on there so you might tell people about that because i, I don't think a lot of people would be aware of that yeah uh, uh okay so the fall of the soviet union was followed by uh the uh, quote unquote transition uh from a communist to capitalist economy and from you know autocratic rule to quote unquote democracy and so the the 10 years from uh, 1991, uh, not quite 10 years until uh, Vladimir Putin came to power, was one of the one of the worst periods in Russian history, and it was it was truly a, a, a tragedy of massive proportions. And I think that the current war in Ukraine is is a is a direct product of that process. So basically what happened is that when Russia, uh, when, when Soviet Union collapsed, you had, um, you had how hundreds or perhaps thousands of Western experts and consultants who descended on Moscow uh, and basically established a rule over Russia through a network of uh, non-government organization and private consultancies and they even brought it to the you, you know they're, they're, they even brought it to the point where you have cia agents employed as officials in the russian government uh you had organizations um, organize, non-government organizations that were actually writing decrees that Boris Yeltsin would sign during the few hours that he was sober in his office. And uh, the country was ruled by decree by Boris Yeltsin and by uh, a limited network of these advisors and consultants that were all working on behalf of Western uh, capital interests. And the result of all that is that 
a vast amount of Russian wealth was was transferred into Western hands. A very very conservative estimates are that it was any any anything between two hundred and six hundred billion dollars, which you know back in those days used to be a lot of money, but some estimates say that it's, it was much more than that. That was it was close to a trillion. So basically, all the all the cream assets of the Russian economy, you know, enterprises that had control over uh, Russian fisheries, arable lands, uh, timber, uh, energy reserves, uh, metals reserves, it was all stolen. And so, the Western powers today would like to have that back. And what happened is that when Vladimir Putin came to power, which they believed that, that he would continue to do their bidding, but they got a surprise because he didn't. And he stopped this process of, of uh, industrial scale plunder and then began to reverse it. And uh, the result is that 60% of the Russian population during this period fell into poverty. Uh, one in four households is, was uh, in what the World Bank called desperate poverty. Uh, we had hundreds of thousands of people dying by suicide, alcohol poisoning, uh, assassination, murder. Um, easily preventable diseases like uh, diphtheria, dysentery, um, and others, uh, cancer, heart disease, they all exploded. The health, the health system imploded. Uh, Russians suffered um, malnutrition on a large scale. Um, so basically, over those 10 years, the Russian population lost between five and six million people by, you know, by the demographic trends. So between what would be a normal demographic trend and what actually happened uh, between five and six million people died prematurely. And uh, that that only happens that kind of that scale of mortality uh, only happens to nations who are at, at war and Russia wasn't at war at the time. And so, you know, when Vladimir Putin on some occasions said that this was one of the greatest tragedies of the 20th, 20th century, this is what he means. It's not that he is nostalgic about uh, the Soviet Union. It's that this really was a tragedy of massive proportions. And it was entirely the doing of Western systems of power. And we know this because similar transitions happen in my country so former yugoslavia i'm i'm from croatia but croatia used to be part of former yugoslavia and we also transitioned from you know com communist regimes to the quote unquote democracy and uh, we also had the same transition happen in many countries in eastern europe including poland none of them endured this kind of uh, this kind of a uh, tragedy what i'm like over the, I suppose prior to anything going on, like I was seeing Irish government, English government, looking at everything around the world and seeing what idiots were being put in place. And the only person that was making sense and that sounded intelligent was Putin. And like, if you even look at say, you know, banning GMO and a load of different things and the love of the people have, but yet, the mass media is putting him out as if he's the worst person in the world. And other guests that we've got none, you know, they were just talking about refugee camps, how good they are there, as opposed to child trafficking in the other ones. And I know friends that have actually tried to help in refugee camps. Every single thing that's being said, it's the actual opposite. Yeah. Well, you know, a few uh, a few months ago. I, I watched a, a, a video that's available still on YouTube, and it was a lecture by Vladimir Posner to the Yale, Yale University uh, class, some, some event. Uh, I think this was in 2018. And one of the things that Vladimir Posner said is that he actually went and paid. Uh, Vladimir Posner used to be like a media personality in the United States. I think he had some kind of a show with uh, Phil Donahue. Basically, what he said is that he 
actually paid a group of researchers to go through the archives of the New York Times uh, for over over, uh, over a three year period. Uh, I think he was referring to 2015, 2016, 2017. And he asked them to find any story that mentions Russia in positive light. Any, any, any story that has something good to say about Russia. And they found zero, not a single one. And that, that tells you everything. You know, you, you're in the West, you know, there's a fatwa against saying anything good about Russia. And then you, you, can, you can piece together from there how come uh, we have these, uh, these uh, misguided ideas about Russia and about Vladimir Putin. It's because it's done deliberately. And anything, anything positive that actually does emerge it gets purged very quickly. My book was one of them, but there was also there was also a, an article in the Forbes magazine a few years ago, when one uh, one journalist basically presented a bunch of charts about the evolution of Russian economy and society. You know things like um, mortality, uh, GDP, GDP per capita. Um, Russian uh, the approval of uh, the approval of Vladimir Putin, uh, whether Russians feel happy or not happy, whether they feel that their country is moving in the right direction and so forth. So these all these were all like numbers, figures coming from uh, you know Gallup, from Ipsos, from from various even even many from World Bank, from Western sources, most of them. Uh, well, his art article was taken down. It was just a factual article. It wasn't. He wasn't saying about how wonderful Russia is. He just presented the the facts from Western sources mostly, and he even added a little bit of very timid, defensive text, saying like, "Hey, I'm not saying that Russia is great, but look at all these figures. You know, it's just it's it's objective data." And nevertheless, that was deleted. So you know, obviously, uh, we in the West have to hate Russia, we have to think that Vladimir Putin is the, the next dragon to slay. And that's why, uh, you know, it's very hard for many people to even consider that maybe none of this is true. Excellent. And just going on a little tangent, but kind of showing about the fraud going on in the world, something that's kind of current with FTX, but also because I I've seen one of your articles as well in turn I don't know how you pronounce it, Turnias, like what happened with that? Because I remember reading about that. I think they were on Forbes and everything, but the whole lot's orchestrated. But I I know you can talk in more detail on them. Yeah, it uh, the company was called Theranos, and it was another uh, thing hatched between. Stanford and the Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley venture capital funds. Uh, you know, it's almost as though there's a there's a there's a template to this mass scale fraud that keeps happening in the in the Western world, well, partic particularly in the United States. And you know, I I looked into Theranos. Uh, in detail, because I, I remember the story from my hedge fund days. It was happening in uh, 2015, 2016. It was in the news. I, you know, I, I, I realized that there was something fishy about the story. You know, beyond just the founder and CEO of Theranos, Elizabeth Holmes, being a fraud. But I realized there was something, something else wrong with it. You know, uh, and and part of it is that she had. Her board of directors was like the who's who of that deep state organization. You know, you had Henry Kissinger, you had uh, George Shultz, the former state secretary. Uh, you had a bunch of generals and admirals and everybody from the, you know, defense establishment. And for many years, there was nobody who had anything to do with healthcare, with uh, diagnostics, with uh, biochemistry. And the company was about this new technologies for diagnosing disease. And it was only after the, after, after the pandemic happened that I realized that that venture was actually entirely related to what we were going through with the pandemic, that the Theranos was not meant as a, as a great, you know, technological advance. It was, it was intended as an information weapon against the public. 
where you would have these uh, very highly advanced uh, blood analyzers that could uh, uh, diagnose uh, over 200 diseases from a small droplet of blood, but the data was analyzed somewhere in some, on some servers in the Silicon Valley, and you had no transparency into any of that because it was all, you know, privately held technology and trade secrets and so forth. So basically, they could, from, from one center, they could contrive uh, an outbreak of, uh, of, of a pandemic in any nation the way they conceived it. And so I, I unfortunately, you know, once, once I write the story, I kind of let it go and then it recedes into the fog. So I can't tell you a lot of uh, detail, but I have on my, on my website, I have a, a three series article called Theranos, the, the real story along with a with a 40 minute uh youtube video where where i've explained it in in great detail and and i also have to point out that the whole story has a very very encouraging optimistic uh silver lining to it so if if anybody's curious i'd i'd really encourage them to 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 have a read or look and with the recent thing with ftx then that's kind of yeah. rippled the you know the crypto world I mean, we've seen all the connections with MIT, Gary Gensler, the whole lot. It's yeah, uh, yeah. it's it's like yeah. I, the thing is now people are having them conversations. Whereas ten years ago, people didn't really care. Now everyone is kind of waking up to it. So that's why you know they're they're failing fast. Yes, 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 absolutely. I agree. I agree, and I think that this is exactly the effect of that. You know, people shifting away from where they're being deceived and looking to sources where they where they find sense and then the you know the, the the cumulative effect of that is that their their houses of cards are coming down faster and faster no, exactly and just finally before i pass you over to my german friend hartmund i i know that poland was trying to get on to germany to get something like 1.3 trillion dollars for world war ii what's the kind of update on that have you anything on what's what's happening with that one well, I, think, I, I read I that think, on your substack yeah as well. I, I i think that that's, that's actually quite amazing and uh, i must say i was i was astonished because you know germany and poland now nominally they are both they should be allies, right? They're both part of NA the NATO. They're all in, in the, they're both in the European Union. Why would Poland decide to antagonize Germany at this moment? Why would they do this? And, uh, you know, I kind of looked into it and then I came across this character, um, Radek Sikorsky, you know, and I realized that he's completely a British agent, you know, and, and you know, Britain, I think everything that we're looking at today geopolitically derives from the British Empire, which, you know, the British Empire has always had this obsession with controlling the Eurasian landmass. And the way they used to do it is that they would just pit a nation against a nation, make sure that they're all uh, quarreling, that they're all fighting one another, and that nobody can mm, become strong enough to rival to rival the, the empire and take control over any important area of that landmass. And so I saw that, you know, since Radek Sikorsky became uh, first uh, the defense minister, then the foreign minister, and now he's an MEP, uh, he's been extremely influential in Poland, but he's been basically uh, the agent that, you know, was very active in the 2014 uh, coup in Ukraine. He's been very active in antagonizing Russia. He's been very active in antagonizing Germany and consciously so because, you know, one of the Polish uh, magazines leaked uh, a recording of a conversation between Sikorsky and I think, I think it was the current prime minister, Tadeusz Mazowiecki, but I could be wrong. Maybe it was somebody else. But basically, Sikorsky said, we are going to antagonize Russia and Germany. And then, you know, you have, a, you have this military pact between Great Britain and Poland, which was signed in 2017 in December, which, you know, why? They're, they're all in NATO already. They're already, 
milita militarily allied with one another. Why do you need another military pact on top of that? And then we also know that there was a in this in, in, in I think in February 2022 there was another military pact signed between Britain and Poland and Ukraine. And Turkey was supposed to be part of it as well, but Turkey pivoted. It didn't happen. And uh, basically, so we see that, you know, the the current escalations and, and, and all the military adventurism has to do with this, with, with the empire, which is, you know, another reincarnation of the British empire. Maybe, you know, Britain, Britain is still the, how do you call it, the ide ideological headquarters of it all, and even financial headquarters of it all. But the military muscle, the, the economic muscle, the political muscle is predominantly still the United States. And then other nations are involved in a way like France, Germany, Sweden, Poland, Ukraine, and so forth. But thankfully, I think that they've reached the end of the road. And I think that they have no good cards to play anymore. Uh, you know, the one watershed moment was the US withdrawal from Afghanistan. But I think that the looming defeat in 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 Ukraine will will be the end of it. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much, Alex. I'll pass you over to Hartmut. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Alex. A real pleasure to have you on the show here. And um, Thank you. Uh, in your article, you talk about, uh, let's say, about Germany's situation in this very moment. Could, um, uh, Hartmut, could I could I ask you to speak a bit louder? Because I oh, I can you a... hear me now? Can, can you hear me better right now? Yes. Now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, one moment. Do it this way. Okay. And uh, the situation in Germany is a very, let's say, unique one, because on the one hand we have the highest gas prices and we had to come with Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. Germany would have become a very competitive country in the whole world. And also Europe, the Europe, uh, the European Union uh, would benefit of this connection. And uh, the interesting thing is, in my opinion, that Russia and European Union would have established a joint venture, which would be uncompetable in the whole world. And by the destruction of this um, of Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, Germany will be destroyed economically. And I guess the opinion that this is planned because we have here in Germany one of the wealthiest women. Uh, she is called Princess Gloria von Thorn Taxis. And she said that we that we are now establishing the Morgenthau plan, which was the plan of the 50s, to establish Germany back in an agriculture, yeah, situation. And, Aha, so um, to, turn, to turn Germany into an agrarian uh, society. Yes, because they want to destroy Germany and they want to destroy European Union, so that Russia will never be interested anymore in working with Europe together. That Russia has to work with America, because they are, in this very moment, Russia and America are establishing joint ventures in companies. And uh, at the same time, the the big, the key industry in Germany will leave and it will go to China or to America. And then you have, let's say, the European Union will dry out. You will establish a new cluster of society. In Germany, we have the Green Party, which has, let's say, um, we get the impression it has a little, big communism, communistic touch. And in that moment, when the European Union is weak and Germany is dried out, in that moment, United, uh, United Kingdom can try to rule this new cluster <laughs> yeah i think i think that that's the the fantasy of the british ruling establishment yes but i think that this is no longer possible you know they're 
their historically their dominance was always relying on their navy which used to be by far the most powerful navy in the world you know they could engage in gunboat diplomacy they could go around the world and tell countries okay you do as we please or else we're gonna just you know destroy your cities with our with our with our sailing ships and and, and their guns and that worked but it doesn't anymore because uh, you know in the age of these hypersonic missile your navy is no longer as important as it used to be even the air force is no longer as important as it used to be so all the you know all these all these uh how do you call it air, aircraft carrier that the united states has around the world you know they can basically they can basically be sunk with one with one you know zircon or missile, missile, missile strike yeah. And so, you know, the I think that the equation has changed dramatically. With regards to Germany, you know, I, I don't I don't really know how to read the situation exactly. The, Germany has been something of an economic miracle in the late 20th century. Germany has been uh, the large until I think it was overtaken by China only only in the last few years, but Germany was the world's largest exporting nation. Yes. And not only that, but Germany was by far the global leader, uh, by far the biggest uh, home country of the so-called global leaders. And basically what they mean by that is when uh, when a company is either first in the uh, occupies one of the th top three places in terms of market share, for some export product and, and in a lot of cases it's completely um obscure stuff that you wouldn't know about you wouldn't know what these companies are or, or even what these products are but german companies uh were the world leaders and i i might get the number wrong off the top of my head but i think that germany had something like 1500s of these companies that were global leaders and the the nation that was second to Germany was the United States with about 300 global leaders. So there was, you know, Germany had a unique economic dynamism of producing highly advanced, high quality, uh, very competitive products that they exported all over the world. And that was the source of German economic power. Now, how that happened is a different story, but it has to do with German banking system, which is, you know, very, very uh, decentralized. What well, it, it was, it was decentralized, distributed. You know, seventy percent of German banks were serving local communities. They were non-profit banks, and you know, you had you had abundant competitive funding for real economy, not for this, uh, you know, wishy-washy speculation on stocks and real estate and FTX and, and, and things like that. It was, uh, it was a dynamism that drew real talent to produce products and services of real quality, competitive, export them to the world and bring wealth back to Germany. And you know, one of the one of these uh, Wall Street analysts calculated that about two trillion of value produced by Germany uh, was powered by twenty billion of Russian nat natural gas. And so, severing this connection was obviously, you know, the work of the empire that, you know, is, you know, the British Empire for a very long time was doing everything possible to prevent an alliance and close cooperation between Russia and Germany because that would completely leave them out in the cold they would have they would have no role to play in this relationship and yes. so you know we go back to that pact between Britain and Poland because that's that's who attacked the Nord Stream 2 pipelines and that's who is trying to prevent Germany from being an important player in this Eurasian equation. Now, yeah. what's going to happen? I don't know because I see that th there there's something brewing under the surface in Germany. And uh, you know, a few days ago, we had uh, Chan Chancellor Scholz go to China, 
and you know all the all the public statements everything that comes out in the newspapers is the standard you know the standard stuff of uh, you know european leaders pressuring china on human rights blah 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 all these things but we also saw that there were 100 german corporations that uh, applied to accompany the delegation to china and 12 of them were accepted and went there and i would say that this is a very powerful uh, pressure lobby on german leadership and it's a pressure lobby that cannot be ignored because in these circumstances today actually these industrialists make common front with labor with with all the labor unions they both have the same interest they want to stay in business they want to stay competitive people want to have their job and everybody wants to be fed and and warm during the winter and so you know maybe in the ruling coalition of germany somebody could take uh, olaf schultz out but they cannot take out this growing pressure uh, social pressure on the government to actually talk to the russians to talk to the chinese to mend the ties and to get back to the business of developing the economy and improving the standards of living and trading with the other emerging nations and we also saw uh, i think it was wednesday a week ago or two weeks ago uh, the turkish president erdogan who went on on on, on television for an interview it was a it was a turkish tv channel and he actually said that in the last month uh, olaf schultz actually had a complete change of heart about the whole situation and that he wants to find a common language with the russians and some people believe that erdogan and the chinese in this case are the intermediaries and that you know below the media radars these relationships are actually starting to starting to be cultivated again so you know at some point in the near future we might see uh we might see changes uh and i i don't think anybody can predict because obviously this cannot be reported in the news this, this clearly goes through back channels but there will be changes and i think that the the empire's gambit will fail and that germany will probably uh, free themselves from the clutches of the empire and join the Eurasian integrations. I hope so. At the moment, the problem yeah. is the, the Green Party. This is the yeah the problem in Germany. And, As I call uh, them, the Green the Green Taliban. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, really nearly, uh, it's nearly uh, unbelievable what they do and what they uh, expect. Because, for example, all the bakeries went bank will, are going to be bankrupt in the next three, four, my, five months because they cannot uh, they cannot pay the bill, the gas bills anymore, and um, the whole the whole middle class is um, is in very in a very dangerous position in Germany at the moment. And well, but don't don't worry too much because I think that maybe bakeries will go bankrupt, but the but the insect farms are going to be fine the insect farms yeah uh-huh <laughs> well <laughs> let's let's see you know the inter the interesting thing about um the german the it depends what what the key industry in germany for example like basf or volkswagen is going to do yeah if they really go to china and to usa it will close facilities in Germany or not. This is what we don't know at the moment. Yeah, this is uh, they they play with the thoughts so that everyone in Germany is scared. And um, but whether they will do it, this depends on the negotiations of Mr. Scholz and whether he uh, is following our, our economic Mr. Super Minister Habeck or not. Yeah. Um, but I have one question. We have. We have Vanguard and we have BlackRock. And the interesting thing is this this company, they work very close together also with Microsoft, et cetera. And, and let's say it this way, they have a very communistic touch. I don't know how to explain it because it's not only 
in Germany what's happening. It's in whole Europe, or let's say also in many countries out of Europe. And do you know why they have to touch, or do you know from the hedge point, hedge fund point of view, whether there are also companies who have an opposite opinion? Yes. Uh, so uh, you know, companies like Black BlackRock and Vanguard grew tremendously over the last, uh, let's call it, fifteen years since the last financial crisis, and I was. I observed this with some personal, you know, stake in the game because, you know, 15 years ago, if you if you started an investment fund, a hedge fund, you know, it was it was it was a simple thing to do. You know, you set up a hedge fund in the Cayman Islands, uh, a, comp, um, a management company in the Cayman Islands and, a, and an onshore advisory. So that was basically the structure. And uh, back in those days if you had good performance so you you had good re investment results you had some kind of an investment process that you could explain to investors that, that they liked you could build a business and it was dead easy you could be uh, two guys with a computer and a dog in a garage it didn't matter what mattered was your results and so you had uh, let's say a universe of maybe 10 to 15000 hedge funds in the world. The problem with 10 to 15,000 hedge funds in the world is that they channel uh, capital towards the uses that would give them the best return on that capital. So if it was uh, oil production, money went to oil production. If it was uh, raising uh, cattle, money went to raising cattle. Now, you know, people in Davos decided that they don't want to do all that. They don't want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, an oil-based economy, they don't want to raise cattle, they want to raise insects, and they want to have wind farms and solar farms. And so it was necessary to bring the capital to uh, these a handful of very large companies that you could control, and that you can make them invest on the basis of ideology. So you said very rightly that it's kind of communistic, because you have like a Politburo who decides okay, we're not going to explore for oil, we're not going to uh, produce gas, we're going to produce these, these, these wind monstrosities and put them everywhere, even if they don't make sense economically, even if they don't have a positive return on, on invested capital. And we're going to destroy all the, all the farmers and we're going to replace them with, with, with you know, insect farms because that's what we want to feed the population. To do all that, you had to concentrate capital in just a few hands. Now, how they did this is not entirely clear to me, but they, you know, they made it very onerous for investors to invest with small funds. You know, they started, they started making this impossible, you know, supposedly to protect investors from risk. They started creating these impossible regulatory requirements where, you know, you find yourself suddenly as an investment manager spending 90% of your energy on stuff that absolutely doesn't make sense on paperwork, on administration, on compliance. You know, the number one job search was compliance officers. Everybody needs compliance officers because they need to be able to navigate through this maze of completely insane rules. And obviously, they're not doing any kind of a job protecting investors, you know, i.e. FTX and all these other uh, frauds that keep happening. So investors are not protected. The whole point of the agenda was to take capital away from this very diverse universe of managers to bring them into a, 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 under a handful of, you know, uh, politically um, pliable politburos and to then direct capital into ideologically driven investments. Okay. So, um, so the problem is that, that the money c cannot flow so easily anymore as as it was in the past, and they uh, have yeah, that's correct. Market in the, I, 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 the market. 
uh, forgive me, Hartmut. I just remember that I didn't answer the other part of your question because you. Uh, you they don't. They me. don't. Uh, they control the market right now because now the money doesn't flow so easily anymore. It cannot flow so easily anymore, and for this reason, Vanguard and BlackRock, they uh, control the market, and so they can implement the governments. For example, the the green energy is is one of the biggest lie because they get the same money. Uh, like the other energy uh, producers, it also if the wind park doesn't work, uh, yeah, this is this is uh, this is insane. And uh, yeah, yeah, this is the profit of the high price. Yeah, yeah, this is this is actually a wholesale Sovietization of the Western economies. But uh, what, what what I didn't reply uh, to you part of your question, you asked me whether whether there are. There are disagreements. There are, you know, fractures. There, there are, yeah, there, whether, whether there are other companies, yes, let's say who work for the for the other side or who said no, yes, this is something yes. what we don't want. Yes, there are, and we've we've seen over the last months, you know, as the as this crisis started to get more and more acute, we've seen that some people are simply jumping ship, pulling their money out of uh, BlackRock and Vanguard. And they are uh, they are going back into oil production and gas production and farming and these other things. So uh, you know it's a it's a it's a fluid situation. But I think that the these pressures that are building bottom up are going to overwhelm this very very small uh, group of parasites that want to completely rearrange the human society and even even our biology yes i i i think they're going to lose because their their agenda is so ambitious and so demented and so complex that it would require a very very significant organization a large command and control hierarchy that would need to execute flawlessly for over many, many years. And they're already, you know, coming apart as it is. They barely started, you know, uh, with the with the pandemic and, and the you know, pandemic was meant to be just the opening gambit, followed by all kinds of other things. But I, I think that there's no appetite to go along with this. And they can't just, you know, you can't just have Klaus Schwab forcing everybody and then people actually obeying. Well, let's see. Um, the problem here, for example, in Germany, that the the farmers, they have to, um, for example, in in the, concerning the fertility, they have to uh, they have to um, use specific quantity of of fertility, and this is so low right now that the protein content of the wheat is so worse that they cannot produce any bread anymore. So the situation is that the whole wheat production is only used for pigs, but not for bread in Germany itself. So oh that that the they want to have a civil war in Germany so that they can establish the military. Yeah, it's, this is the problem. But I pass it to Jane. It was Thank you so much, Alex. It was a real pleasure talking Thank to you. you. Thank you, Hartwood. Thank you. Hi, Alex. Hi, Jane. You know, I listen to you and I'm so grateful. I spent 15 years of my life learning what would help other people. And, you know, when you're so deep into that, you don't see the world seen like you have. So when this all broke out, I understood because of my studies that something much bigger was happening, but I had to get up to speed fast. <laughs> So I just love having these conversations with you and it's just, yeah, so appreciated. Thank, Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that, Jane. Yeah. And so I think my question goes to now we can see the deep state and I love how you explained it. That really simplifies it of the Western, um, the Western conglomerate. <laughs> but I've always been like, but this started in the East like the first steps started in the East. So I wondered if you could tie in the Chinese deep state into the Western deep state and how that's transpiring. Okay, so uh, 
it's not going to come up what you expect because uh, I'm not in, I don't have clarity on this question entirely. However, I've been wondering for the past few years about the role of China in this world. And for a very long time, I had, uh, how do you call it? I had a certain, I, I, I wouldn't say fear of China. I would say misgivings and a, a worry about what the Chinese are doing. However, here's a broader context. Um, China has been historically the global economic superpower for centuries. And that only collapsed with the with the with the British Empire's colonization, with uh, with the uh, you know the, the two the two opium wars. China was brought to be one of the poorest nations in the world. The Chinese call this a century of humiliation, and, and they, they understand very precisely who exactly did this to them and the center of power where this emanates from. And the, the pattern over the last several uh, decades has been extremely interesting. Well, basically, you know, since 1971, when, when, when the United States uh, broke the, uh, the Bretton Woods Agreement, what that is, they, they, they severed the, the dollars linked to gold. They made the dollar not redeemable in gold and turned it into completely um, a fiat currency. Uh, the people who are at the top of the you know, empire's pyramid understood that they would end up completely depleting the host, being the United States, and that they needed the new host. They needed a new global cup, you know, because the empire itself is not, you know, we, we don't have an emperor sitting on a throne anywhere anymore. It's simply a, a network of vested interests that run the show. And they can enter in any nation, co-opt their structures, their military power, their, uh, you know, help themselves to their, you know, economic resources to continue building their empire. And what is clear is that what they decided to do is they designated China as their next host. And what you saw very quickly after this uh, severing of the, of the dollar gold link is that Henry Kissinger and Nixon, they went to, to China to start to opening, to, to start to open China. And the Chinese accepted this. They agreed this was very advantageous to China. And from there, we had spectacular rise of China, which went from being complete backwater of the world to being one of the greatest economic superpowers. Well, probably the greatest economic superpower today. Their way was paved forward. They got everything they needed. They got the capital. They got uh, technological know-how. The West supplied them with everything. They allowed them to manipulate the currency to make themselves the most competitive exporting power in the world, things that would not be allowed to any other nation. Okay? And so my concern was that China had actually accepted the role of the next global cup. But this, this didn't happen, actually. All right? Uh, China did something else they drew in these networks of power they led them on to make them believe that they would they would be their next global cup but they actually drew them in to behead them and this is not something you know the reason why i don't have clarity because this is obviously not something you know like china is now actually doing something that you know you would you know like when you watch uh, crime movies and then you have a, a an undercover cop who is completely embedded in, in 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 some mafia network but he's not there to be a mafioso he's there to destroy the network i believe that this is what china is doing and you can see it from the statements of people like george soros who literally 10 years ago uh praised china 
he said that this is the model of the future this is the model of governing a, a nation uh and he was saying that china was definitely going to be the next uh that, that china was going to carry the the globalization process forward and then in the last few years he changed his record completely and he started complaining well yeah china is no good for human rights and uh, it's, a, it's a tyranny and xi jinping is the most dangerous man in the world and so on and so forth because in the meantime they realized that they've been taken in and that they're going to end up uh, destroyed there's no next global cup so i think that chinese are playing um a very long game but that the objective of their game is to behead these very centers of powers that have uh, afforded them this day, their century of humiliation and so we can see that they have infiltrated the united states particularly uh throughout the society the, the cultural structures the educational organizations the politics the, the you know the the, the corporations the, the chinese are everywhere and they have clearly deliberately corrupted leading uh, democratic politicians and so now we know that you know um nancy pelosi's children joe biden's children uh, politicians like Diane Feinstein, uh, like um, oh God, I can't think of their all, all their names, but there 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 are quite a few of these important politicians. We know that they have interests in China, but the Chinese have the receipts. They know everything, so uh, they are in a very strong position to actually uh, destroy this network of power. Now, the next question is. Uh, if you have this new emerging power, and let's let's suppose that the Chinese manage to destroy these uh, Western, you know, finan financiers in the city of London and on Wall Street, uh, are we going to be saddled with something even worse, even even more evil? And I actually tend to think not, because there's also a very, very important uh, cultural aspect to all this. And it's the following, you know, we, we, we are the Western Empire, the, the Western civilization. Over the last 500 years, the Western civilization has destroyed six indigenous civilizations around the world and literally thousands of smaller tribes and kingdoms and, and cultures. We have, not, not because we are individually evil people, but be, because we have espoused a very pathogenic system which is based on on you know this fraudulent money that we use and and i think that china for all the centuries that it has been the superpower in the world hasn't ha had this hasn't showed this cultural inclination so the chinese emperors sent very very large expeditions around the world that went to the americas to africa Egypt, uh, they went all around the world, as far as we know, but they didn't colonize any nation. And so I believe that we don't have to fear China. But we can expect ugly things because the China, the, the Chinese today are the undercover cop in the in the in the horribly rotten Western world. And that fight is probably going to continue being quite ugly. And I can't say that I understand everything that the Chinese Communist Party is doing, but clearly a lot of things that they are doing don't make any kind of sense on the face of it. You know, like the zero COVID policy. To adopt a zero COVID policy, you would have to be stupid. And they're clearly not stupid. So. The agenda is something else, but I, I don't. I, I can't say that I know what it is. I can, I can guess, but you know, better not even go there. Thank you so much. Love Thank you, um, guys. I have a vet arriving in five minutes, <laughs> so I have to jump off. Who would like to take over and ask one more question from Alex? I well, I have one concerning China and uh, the, the role which is uh, which is 
playing China in the world, the situ the problem what I see concerning China is that the whole European Union is establishing the technocratic system of China in Europe. For example, Karlsruhe, a city in Germany, will get face recognition. The University of Munich is also specialized in social scoring. And um, and this are things so that so that the system which is used in China will be implemented in Europe. And and also what we don't understand is the the Chinese police stations, for example, in Canada, and also it comes now to Europe. For example, in Croatia is one, in Italy is one, and in Germany our chancellor think about it. So these are things what we don't what what we don't get. And for this reason, we think that China is maybe not a good idea. And the Africans, they don't like China. Oh no, I'm sorry. I have to I have to push back against this hard one. Uh, my understanding is that Africans like China very much. Really? Okay. Yeah, I was uh, I was in a conference in uh, in uh, in Frankfurt uh, a few years ago, and there was uh, there were many many delegates from different African nations, and there were some presentations of projects uh, that the Chinese are financing in Africa. And, you know, these presentations were like, oh, you know, all these wonderful things, but they were all clearly projects funded by the Chinese. So I was expecting that they would, you know, speak in superlatives about these projects. But then I made a point uh, during the pauses and in, during the meals, I would, I would ask people, you know, Africans who were there and I would say like, okay, so, you know, these presentations were very nice, but really, what's really going on? And to a person, and so I would speak with somebody from Senegal, from somebody from Cameroon, somebody from um, Yemen, uh, se se several African countries. To a person, they said, oh no, this is a complete change for us. For the first time ever, African people are actually looking forward to the future. They're actually optimistic. The Chinese treat us completely differently than the Westerners, you know. They give us uh, investment funds. They give us the equipment. If the equipment breaks down because, you know, we don't know how to use it, they send engineers, they send spare parts, they send instructors. The Western the Western investors would punish them. They would, you know, like uh, say like, okay, you broke, you broke this tractor. Now you owe us the money for replacing this. It's like everything changed dramatically. So I think that we have to be really, really careful about uh, the narratives that are being given us. There's also... You know the narrative in the West that the that the Chinese are pushing African nations into debt traps. They're giving them money, but then they want to you know take the collateral. And you have Johns Hopkins University that did, ran a very extensive study. They looked at three thousand different loans that the Chinese have given to various African countries over the over a twenty year period, and they didn't find a single case where if the if the African partner failed to repay the loan, that the Chinese moved to repossess the collateral, not even a single case. So we're getting a narrative. Again, China bad, fear China. I don't know what to tell you about the face recognition things. I've seen, we've seen many of those videos of people walking around with a little square around their head because the computer, I, I have a certain experience in AI. Okay, I've, I've, I've managed for a number of years uh, uh, a project. We built one such system from the ground up. This is more fear porn than reality. These systems are very easy to defeat with very low tech uh, measures. You can wear a hat. You can put makeup in ways that doesn't fit the facial features. You, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do. And, and these, these systems are very fragile. You can also take down these towers. You can spray paint the, the camera systems. There's a lot of people things people can do if they decide to rebel, if they decide to not comply. None of this works if people don't comply because you know the, 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 the capacity of police 
to repress the people is actually very, very small. The system really depends on people complying. And I think that Germans are very compliant people, but to a limit. You know, there's going to come a limit where they're going to say, no mas. And then mm. all of these very high technological uh, widgets that they come up with, not going to be good. You know, like you can take down a 5G tower, you can take down the the cameras, you can spray paint them, you could you could wear a hat, you can wear a, you know, the, the, the mask, you can do so many things. It's not like it's this flawless, hermetic matrix that you cannot get out of. And I'll tell you another reason why, why, why they're doing all this. Because they're preparing a new monetary system for us. They're preparing these programmable central bank digital currencies. When people force a currency on, on an economy, and if it's too onerous, it's too restrictive, people just shift to black and gray markets. Okay, so let's say you go to a gas station and you can't buy gas for your car because it says like you're exceeded your carbon credits. You know, somebody will think up to steal a tanker of gas and they're going to sell it on the black market. And you're not going to know a friend who knows a friend who knows how to get you a tank of gas. That happens. And all this big control matrix is being put in place so that people are locked into this new monetary system so that they don't create alternative uh, black markets and underground economy. Because if you look at nations like Venezuela and Argentina today, in Venezuela, practically half of the GDP is the underground economy and Argentina is one third of the GDP. 100%, if they go forward with this, uh, European nations are going to have a huge chunk of their GDP in in the underground economy, we're going to get, you know, black market chickens and eggs and gas and, and whatever, whatever you need. And, you know, once it's on the black market, it's out of their control and they can't. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the, yeah, because it is, it is interesting because uh, we discussed it earlier that G Germany wants to limit cash money for, uh, from the first January, 2023. And, um, the U.S. is going to establish the digital U.S. dollar, which is called the Biden token, which is a programmable token, yeah, or which shall be a programmable token, uh, programmable, programmable by the by the by the Fed. Yeah, but it's not going to work. It's not going to work, and I can tell you that because all as as late as 2019, so m just months before the the pandemic, they had nothing ready. We're talking extremely complex projects. You know, programmable tokens, it's, it's, it's nice to fantasize about it, but to actually put it in practice, it's extremely difficult. You know, they would have to track for the United States, 330 million people and their buying habits and their carbon credits and all of this. I guarantee you, they're not going to be able to pull it off. It's going to be hackable for one thing. You know, somebody's going to come in and, 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 and break it for them. It's, it's not going to work. It's, going to, it's just going to push people into trading uh, with Bitcoin, with silver coins, with gold coins, uh, trading favors, whatever. They're going to push a huge chunk of the economy onto the black markets, and they're not going to be able to get it back. I mean, you would have to send a military and create concentration camps. You know, uh, this, this, it, it, I, I don't think it'll work out, and I think that we have to not fear them but we have to prepare to not comply, not conform, and to uh, to have our own alternatives. How, however, however simple, basic they seem, they will evolve very quickly once the necessity becomes urgent. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I, I pass it to Grace. It was really <laughs> good to have you on the show. My pleasure. Thank you. Hey, Alex, I know you're just a quick question. You're a father of two sons, right? So yes, do, do, do they ask you about what's going on? How do you respond to these kids? Because we have listeners and viewers with kids. Yes, look, I, I first of all, I have a policy of never, never deceiving them. 
deliberately. So if they ask questions, I, I try to give them a straight answer, you know, to the extent that they can comprehend. Uh, I often have, you know, uh, Jimmy Dore and the Duran on podcast playing in the back to, to follow the situation. I have, you know, economists like Michael Hudson and, you know, uh, a lot of a lot of people like that, Joe Rogan. And so they hear all this stuff. It, it kind of makes an impact. They, they understand. They ask, like, who is this Joe Biden? You know, is he good or is he bad? And Donald Trump, who is he? So they ask, I, I tell them, they you know they, they they don't follow this with 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 great focus but they're vaguely aware and then they ask me questions from that are, are are russians the bad side in this war or, or not or, or are the ukrainians so i tell them so they know that's perfect thank you and so um tell us more or the our viewers where to get in touch with you other than the website that's there you know and I'm posting also the, your book. And yes, mention your other books as well. Well, OK, so I have, I have two other books which are free, uh, available as free downloads from my website. So my website is uh, uh, iSystem Trend Following, iSystem-TF.com. And under About uh, label, there's a uh, two PDF downloads. And I didn't put them for free because they're not worth anything. I put them for free because Amazon canceled my account. Uh, they stole all my royalties and they continued to sell my books. At, I, I Last time I looked, uh, one of my books was selling for nine, something like $900. And so I, I thought, no way, no, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll give my books away for free before I let Amazon earn nine hundred dollars, and you know, uh, basically as an act of piracy. Uh, I'm on Twitter uh, at Naked Hedgy. I have a, a YouTube channel, which for which unfortunately I don't have a lot of time. I, I I found it great fun to put up, you know, videos on YouTube, but it takes a lot of work, and I'm really uh, very very <laughs> spread very thin. Uh, the, the YouTube channel is called Markets, Trends, and Profits. And uh, I think for American audiences, I'd also like to mention that I have a partnership with, uh, with an American investment advisors uh, with whom we've developed uh, 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 an investment portfolio that uh, is resilient versus, with regards to inflation and the possible stock market collapse. Uh, unfortunately, that cannot be advertised because there's all these compliance and regulation rules. But if anybody uh, should be interested to look into that, uh, I, unfortunately, they have to reach out to me personally. And uh, that's about that's about all. That's uh, th th that's actually more than I can handle at this moment. But uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn, but I I visit seldom because I find LinkedIn a little bit sterile. <laughs> given today's given today's events thank you again uh, for sure i i asked my financial advisor who is really just as honest and truthful as you are and he he i said oh i'm gonna have alex Craner, you know about trend compass and he said oh yeah so i said i'm gonna oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> all right so thank Very you good. And, uh, roy hartmut jane and i it, um really grateful that you've had and maybe in the future you can please come back again because yes so with 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 pleasure grace okay. with with, right. with pleasure yeah thank you thank okay. you for having me uh, warm greetings to all your all your viewers and uh, it was very it was very nice to meet you grace and hartmut and roy and uh, and jane as well she's uh, she's off but uh, yeah it was a pleasure to talk to you all and take care everyone please like subscribe share and donate if you you know when you're able to and support alex and all of us here take care bye bye all the best all the best